Second Epistle of John, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world. We confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's seed. For he that biddeth him God's seed is partaker of his evil deeds. John the Baptist said, whenever the Lord came on the scene and people reported to John the Baptist that there were folks now gathering down at the river where Jesus was at and that his disciples were baptizing, they didn't understand how it was that this ministry seemed to be changing hands. They thought maybe John would uh, have something to say to criticize what the Lord was doing down there at the river. But he said a man can receive nothing except it is given to him from heaven. And that is one of the spiritual philosophies that I just can't get around that a man's got to preach what God's put on his heart. Every man's got his own ministry. What he says, if he's not careful, he can, it's easy to try to preach something that doesn't really belong to it. And uh, I want to preach what belongs to me, what God has dealt with me about. I'm not one for pretty titles. We'll just call this Ken Radio's Oneness Message. I haven't always been oneness, but I am now, and uh, what I believe now is different from anything I ever believed in my life. John said here in the second epistle, he said, if any man comes to you preaching any other doctrine about Jesus than what we've given him, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's seed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. I want to say to you tonight that I think it's an important issue to deal with in our day. We need to understand clearly about who it is that we worship. The God that we worship we are the only folks that I know of in the world that worships the God that we worship. The organization that I'm a part of represents, by and large, the largest group of people on the face of the earth that believe what we believe about God. I think it's important the way a man defines God. I believe that it makes all the difference in the world whether your God has one head or three heads. I think it's a fact that has been grossly neglected in our day because there's a lot of talk about Jesus. There's a lot of folks with bumper stickers that says Jesus is Lord. But there's a tragedy in as much as the, the vast majority of the people that profess to know the Lord don't really know the Lord. They don't know who the Lord is. They don't have the foggiest idea of the facts of who God is. I believe in order to go to heaven, you need to know who God is. I don't think you can go to heaven without knowing who God is. And there's a lot of people that will talk all day long about the Lord, and they don't know who He is. And the reason I use this text tonight, John's statement here is probably one of the most abused and misused texts in the entire Bible. John is saying that an antichrist and a deceiver is a man who does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now, the, the reverse of that is what a lot of people use to justify their Christian faith. They think that because they believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, 
that they're saved. Now, if that statement meant only what a lot of people think it means, that is, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, the concept that most people have in their brain when they say that is, yes, there was a man. I believe there was a man that lived 2,000 years ago. His name was Jesus Christ. And he was a great prophet. He was a great man of God. He was the Son of God. He healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils, healed blind eyes and deaf ears, and uh, he died and rose again. And so by that they, they attempt to say that they believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. But I don't believe that's what John meant at all when he made that statement. I believe there's much more to that statement than what people read into that. You have to know what the name Jesus Christ means to be able to really get the true context of that statement. You see, the name Jesus means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah Savior. It is a Greek rendition of what we read in the Hebrew as saying Jehovah. The reason Jesus Christ is named Jesus Christ is because his daddy was named Jehovah. And his name, Jesus, means Jehovah Savior. And so when you say Jesus, you're saying Jehovah Savior. Now when John said you must believe that Jehovah Savior has come in the flesh, I have to say there's a lot of folks that don't believe Jehovah Savior came in the flesh. They don't believe that God the Father ever came down. Now you know, the understanding of the oneness of the God here, you know, I, I began to do some digging. I said, I've got to understand this thing. I'll be honest with you. When I came in here in January, when Brother Harold baptized us up in that baptistry in the name of Jesus, I, I was convinced that this was what I wanted to do. This is what I believed. This is the church I wanted to be in. This is a doctrine. But I'll be honest with you. I didn't really understand at that point all about the oneness of God. One of the strongest things I had going for me was that I didn't believe the Trinity. I tried to prove that God was three persons, and I couldn't do it. I, you know, a person being a body and a soul and a spirit. I said, if that's the case, then I've got to prove that God's got three bodies, and he's got three souls, and he's got three spirits. Well, I got bombed out on every count, because, you know, the Bible said there's one Lord, one faith, and one spirit. So you can't, there's no way you can prove there's three spirits in the Godhead when the Bible plainly said there's only one spirit. And then when it comes to proving souls, you know, a man is the only thing we know of that has a soul. A spirit doesn't have to have a soul. If all you were tonight was a spirit, you would have no need of a soul. A soul is that which pertains to man. The Bible said, What things know the things of God, save the Spirit of God, and what things knows the, the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man. Well, we call that our soul. That, that part of us that has to do with the flesh is the soul of a man. Well, I knew God didn't have but one soul because he only came in the flesh in one body, and that was Jesus. I did have some confusion about whether or not God had two or three bodies. And I, I got to talking about, you know, the Holy Ghost having a body, and all I ever saw there was a dove, and I knew that the Godhead didn't consist of two persons and an animal. So I, I was down to two persons at least, but, but I didn't know about the body of the Father. Amen. As I began to research the Old Testament, I never saw God appearing in the flesh. Never had a name in the flesh. He showed up as angels. He showed up as apparitions and spirit forms. But never one time did he come in a body that had a name on it. Amen. But that's why Manoah turned down, uh, the angel turned down Manoah's request. When he said, what is your name? He said, I can't tell you. It's a secret. When Jacob asked the angel of the Lord, what is your name? He said, it's none of your business. Amen. What I'm talking about is God's name was never truly revealed until he came. But the clincher of it all, boy, I was reading in Isaiah here a few weeks ago. And I, I looked and looked and looked. And I really about decided that I, there wasn't any scripture that really came out and said that the Lord was going to come down, that this Holy Ghost or the, or the Father was going to come down as a man. But I found it in the book of Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. He said... The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall cry, yea, he shall roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. And I realize this Bible said, For this cause Jesus Christ came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil. 
Well, who was it? It was the Lord of glory. He said he would come forth as a mighty man. The Lord. Hallelujah. Well, in the 44th chapter of Isaiah, the 24th verse, he said, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. The Trinitarian concept of God that I believed all my life had a, had a subtle picture in the back of my mind of the Father sitting on His throne dictating to the Son how He wanted creation to take place. When the New Testament said, by Him and for Him were all things created, I could see the Son down there doing all the work while the Father sat up on the throne bragging about how good a job the Son was doing. And you'd be surprised how many people actually conceived God to be three persons. They conceive a Father on the throne and the Son in a body of the flesh and a Holy Ghost flying around in the form of a bird in heaven. But this scripture, the Lord said, I'm the Lord that formed you from the womb. He said, I stretched out the heavens alone. He said, I spread forth the earth by myself. When I begin to realize that God that I serve is only one person. He was standing by himself on creation's morning. When he scooped down, he didn't have any companions. Oh, a lot of folks said, let us make man prove that there's two people. It doesn't prove any such a thing. When God specifically by his own voice said, I stood there by myself and did it alone. That doesn't mean he's got somebody helping him. That means he's standing there doing it by himself. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, years ago, before I quit watching television, we used to watch a show called To Tell the Truth. A fellow named Gary Moore. It was a quiz show. And this show, what happened was, every time they'd have a, they'd have a, a quiz, they'd send three people up on a stage. And these three people were all intended to play the role of the same person. And they'd all introduce themselves by the same name. One fellow marched across and said, My name is so-and-so. And the next man would come in, he'd say, my name is so-and-so. And the third one would come in and say, my name is so-and-so. And they'd all sit down behind a desk, and then they had a panel of, of uh, folks over there that was going to drill them and try to get enough information out of the three of them to find out which one of them really was so-and-so. And that was the whole point of it all. And finally, in the end, when they'd ask all these questions and everybody had had their guess about which one was so-and-so, they'd say, well, the real so-and-so, please stand up. But you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing in my heart. I'll tell you, I hate Trinitarianism. Because the way I see it tonight, one of them's got to be right. Now, it doesn't really matter, it, you know, when you, when you get down to the technicalities of the matter whether you believed in the oneness or whether you believed in the Trinity, one of them has got to go. I mean, there's got to be a real definition about who God is. Somebody's got to define either God is this way or God's the other. It, never, it doesn't make a lick of sense to me how it is that Trinitarians and oneness can get along talking about religion in the same context. It doesn't make a bit of sense. If a fellow's a Trinitarian talking with a oneness, it doesn't begin to make a bit of sense. If one of them believes God's got one head and another one believes God's got three heads, I don't see how they could even have a conversation about the same God. It doesn't make any sense to me how you could sit down with a Trinitarian and talk all day long about how the Lord's blessed when their, their God's got three heads and you said your God's got one head and yet y'all are talking like you're worshiping the same God. I'll tell you, I don't believe for a minute it's the same God. I believe by definition, our God's different from their God, and theirs is different from ours. Now, the big challenge is to find out which one of us has got the real God. The argument is, we believe in one God. Well, you see, they say they believe in one God, too. The only problem is, we believe the one God is one person, and His name is Jesus Christ. 
they believe the one God is three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And there's a big difference, if you ask me, between a one-headed God and a three-headed God. And so what I want to do tonight is to bring the, the three persons of the Godhead up here and put them on a panel. And I want to find out not which one of them's God. I want to find out which one of them claims to be the Lord. Because as far as I'm concerned, the Bible said, amen, the first law laid out in Deuteronomy 6 was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It's not a matter that the whole world believes there's one God. It's a matter what they believe that one God's made up of. Amen. I believe that one God is one Lord. I don't believe there's three Lords in the Godhead. It does make a difference. Put God the Father in chair number one. And he walks up and he says, I'm the Lord God. Put God the Son in the second chair. And he says, I'm the Lord God. And put God the Holy Ghost over in the third chair. And he says, I am the Lord God. In the book of Isaiah 44, 24, just what I just got through reading, he said, I am the Lord. That was, now in the Old Testament, we, we, we got to believe the Old Testament. You know, the Trinitarians believe that God the Father was revealed in the Old Testament. And God the Son was revealed in the New Testament. And then when Jesus ascended up into heaven, then he revealed the third person of the Trinity, which had not yet been given, you see. But now the fact of the matter is, that God the Father of the Old Testament, He said, I am the Lord that forms you from the womb. I am the Lord that stretched forth the heavens alone. I am the Lord that, that spread out the earth by myself. In other words, the first fellow sitting here in the chair, he's saying, I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord. Well, the second one here, Philippians, amen, Paul told the Philippians that one of these days, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the second chair over here, he's saying, everybody's going to call me Lord before it's over with. I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord. Well, then you get over here to the third chair. And the one in the third chair, amen, in Corinthians, Paul said, now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Well, so now you got the Holy Ghost over here, and he's claiming to be the Lord. All I want to know is which one of these really is the Lord. Can you tell me? John said in the fifth chapter of 1 John, he said, now there's one Lord. There is one Lord. There is one faith and there is one baptism. Amen. Zechariah prophesied in that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. The reason I'm saying this tonight is we need to understand there's a difference in explanations. If I believe that, there are, that these are three different persons, then that tells me there are people in the Godhead that we don't believe in. That tells me it's a false doctrine. It's a false paganistic concept of God. What I'm trying to say is this. If I came up here with a brass statue of Buddha and set it here on a communion table and said we're going to all stand up here and praise this bronze statue or brass statue of Buddha, I've done no less wickedness than what I've done if I profess that Jesus Christ is a separate person from God the Father. Because the Lord said, I was by myself on creation day. Don't you tell. He said, I'm the Lord and my glory I will not give to another. He said, beside me there is no Savior. There is one Lord. There is one person who calls himself Lord. And he's the only Savior. He said, beside me there is no Savior. I want to tell you he said, I'm the Lord, I change not. He said, my glory I won't give to another. It does make a difference. If you believe there's another person, amen, that stands along with God the Father. I don't know if we got any Trinitarians here tonight or not. If you are Trinitarian, I suggest you fasten your seatbelt. Amen. Because I'm not a Trinitarian. I'm an ex-Trinitarian. I want to tell you it's paganism. And the reason I believe it's paganism is because everything in this Bible says that God is one person. Job said, who has regarded his person? Who is the Lord God? Amen. David asked the question in Psalms chapter 24. Who is the King of glory? The Lord. 
strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He's the King of glory. Well, Isaiah said the Lord shall come forth as a mighty man. Well, who is the King? Jesus Christ is the King of kings. Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords. What's the difference between the Lord and King of the Old Testament and the Lord and King of the New? It's the Spirit of the Father in the Old and His Father come as a man in the New. That's what it is. There's one Spirit. John said no man's seen God at any time. Do you believe that? Nobody's ever seen God at any time. Nobody has ever seen God at any time. Come on now. John said nobody has ever seen God at any time. Amen. Nobody ever saw the Father's body. Nobody. Nobody. This Bible said nobody ever saw the Father's body. If that's what the Bible said, I believe that's what the Bible means. But Paul said Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Amen. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. He said, I came in my Father's name. They said, show us the Father. He said, have I been with you so long and you don't even know who I am yet? The Pharisees said, where is your Father? He said, if you don't believe I am He, ye shall die in your sins. I don't have to concoct that up and say that to you. The Bible said it. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God said, if you don't believe I'm the Father, you'll die in your sins. Why is it such a big issue? I'll tell you why it's a big issue. Because if you don't believe Jesus Christ is the Father, then you think He's not God. You think He's the second person or the third person or whatever you think it is. It's paganism. It's atheism. It's false worship. It's false religion. It's a false God. Jesus is not the second person of the Godhead. He's the Lord come glory. That's who He is. He said, I am sitting down in my Father's throne. Revelation 3. The Father said to him in Hebrews 1 and 8, Under the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. There's a lot of folks getting mixed up. They, they see Jesus talking to the Father, and the Father talking to Jesus, and their little finite mind says, Well, that proves there's two persons. You have to have two persons for them to be able to talk to each other, right? Wrong. Amen. The Father is a spirit. The Son is a man. Come on now. I said the Father is a spirit. No man's ever seen the spirit at any time. Do you hear me? Nobody ever saw that spirit. Where'd that spirit come from? Well, he always has been. Before there ever was a star in the sky, before there was a planet in the solar system, before there was an angel ever created, before there ever was a throne or anything else, God was a spirit. And that God, this Bible, John said one and one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 14th verse said, and the Word was made flesh, not another person, but the Word of God Himself. The Word, the Word is not another person. The Word is the very utterance of the Spirit. The Spirit says, I am the Word, and the Word was made flesh. And who was it but Jesus Christ? the Son of the living God. It was the Spirit talking to the man and the man talking to the Spirit. Stephen said, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. Well, I'll tell you, if you'd have looked on the throne, you'd have seen nothing because the Bible says you've never seen the Father. Is that right? Amen. Who would you have seen? You'd have seen Jesus. Amen. David said the right hand of the Lord is exalted. Amen. Isaiah said he's the arm of the Lord. Jesus Christ is the arm of the Lord. That's why he said, if you see me, you've seen him. That's what I am. I am God manifest in the flesh, Timothy said. Amen. God manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, priest of the Gentiles, and received up in the glory. That's who Jesus Christ is. That's why Paul said God was in Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Hallelujah. How many thrones are you going to see when you get up yonder? John said in the fourth chapter, a throne was set in heaven and one set on it. One set on it. But I'll tell you, all the answers are in the Bible. Every question you can ask has got a plain, plain English answer 
right there in the Word of God. You want to know how many thrones there are in heaven? The Bible said there's one throne in heaven. You want to know how many people there are sitting on it? The Bible said there's one sitting on it. Oh, that's as plain as you need it to be. God's only one person. He never did need any help. He didn't have to have three heads to be smart. Whoever said three heads was better than one's wrong, brother. One head's all God ever had, and that's all he'll ever need. Hallelujah! Praise God forevermore. John saw that throne in heaven. Then he saw another picture of it. This time it was in the New Jerusalem coming down. And he said he called it the throne of God and of the Lamb. The throne of God and of the Lamb. Some folks read that and say, well, see, that proves there's two people. It don't prove nothing of the such, brother. Amen. God the Lamb is one person. Amen. Paul said God was in Christ. Amen. The Father was in the Son. The Father was in the Son. Amen. The Spirit was in the Lamb. That's why the Spirit and the Lamb can sit out on the throne and there's still only one on the throne. It's because the Spirit and the Lamb are the same person. Do you understand what I'm saying to you tonight? Hallelujah. Mary, in singing that song after the angel had said she's going to have that baby, she said, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Well, who was she worshiping? The angel had just said, Amen, that the baby was in her womb was the Savior. Amen. And now she's calling God her Savior. I wonder if she knew which one. I believe she knew. Paul said, he talked about his only wise God and Savior. Is God different from the Savior? Or is the Lord the Savior? Amen. The Lord said in Isaiah, I am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior. And so if Jesus claimed to be the Savior of the world, he had to be the Lord from glory. Matthew 19, 28, the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory. What you have to see is, when Jesus prayed to the Father, it was a man talking to the Spirit. I said it was a man talking to the Spirit. It wasn't no eternal God the Son talking to the eternal God the Father. Amen. I said it wasn't eternal God the Son talking to the eternal God the Father. If Jesus was the eternal God the Son, He wouldn't have said to him when they asked Him when His kingdom was coming, He said the Son of Man doesn't know. If the Son of Man didn't know, He sure wasn't no eternal God the Son. If He's eternal God the Son, He'd have had to know or He wouldn't have been equal with the Father. But the reason He was ignorant about that is because He was speaking as a human being. The human being didn't know Him. But the Father that dwelt in Him did know ever saw a branch that was a different tree from the root that it come out of? Come on now. Amen. Just because you got a branch there doesn't mean you got a different tree. Amen. That's why I'm one with God just like he, Jesus Christ was one with His Father. He prayed, Father, that they might be one even as you and I are one. How did He mean that? Him and the Father are one in as much as the Spirit and the flesh got together. That's the exact same way I'm one with God myself. I'm a branch off of the vine. That's what I am. I'm, a, I'm one with Him because I'm born of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing about Ken Raggio that gave me eternal life. I don't have any capacity whatsoever to save my soul. I'm as lost as a goose when it comes to my own eternal capabilities. But with the Holy Ghost in me, I'm one with God. Amen. He's the root and I'm the branch. Glory to God. I'm in there just like Jesus said. You'll be one with us just like I'm one. I'm the branch and He's the vine. He's the root and I'm the offspring of Him. Psalm 33, 6 said, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. By the very breath and Spirit of God, the heavens were made. Amen. In the beginning, I, I sat down another night reading John 1 and 1. I said, Man, that's amazing. In the beginning was the Word. I said, Well, when was the beginning? Was it the day God made man? No, that wasn't the beginning. Was it the day God made animals? No, that wasn't the beginning. Was it the day God made the plants? No, that wasn't the beginning. Was it the day God made the heavens and earth? No, that wasn't the beginning. Was it the day God made the angels? No, that wasn't the beginning. 
was it the day he built his own throne? No, that wasn't the beginning. It had to have been before everything, before there was anything. Amen. When this universe had nothing in it, when there wasn't anything shining in the nighttime, when there wasn't any clouds, when there wasn't any water, when there wasn't any dirt, when there weren't any comets and constellations and Milky Ways and galaxies, there was a God. And the Bible said in the very first thing that ever happened, out of that great expanse of nothingness that was inhabited by nothing but a spirit, this Bible said in that beginning was the Word. The first thing that could ever be said about that spirit is that He was the Word. He was the Word. He was the Word. The very first Word of God was the manifestation of Jesus Christ. But that Word never had a body of His own until the Word was made flesh in the body of Jesus Christ. John 1.10 said He was in the world. When Isaiah said, The Lord stretched out the heavens alone, spread forth the earth by himself. Then he said, John said, He was in the world, and the world was made by him. The world knew him not. When you begin to realize, friend, who Jesus Christ is, it'll blow your ever loving mind, I'll tell you. You begin to realize, My God, I had a whole wrong concept of Jesus. I had a whole wrong concept of God. I've been thinking all my lifetime, I was going to go to heaven, see three thrones up there with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And I finally realized God never was but one person. He's done everything that's ever been done by Himself. He never had any counselors. He never had any angels that He said, You're my son. He never had any help but along those lines. He said, I did it all by myself. Those angels was made by Him, brother. He didn't counsel with anybody. He didn't need He didn't need a second person or a third person to help Him design an angel. He did it by Himself. He didn't have to have a second or a third person to figure out how to fling the galaxies and the Milky Ways into existence. He did it by Himself. He is one Lord. He is one God. He is one Spirit. And that makes all the difference in the world. Now I'll tell you why I said all that. You know good and well that we're only a small fragment of all the so-called professing Christians in this world. You know that what we believe has absolutely nothing to do with what they believe. Amen. I said what we believe has absolutely nothing to do with what they believe. They preach a false god, brother. They preach a false con and you can't preach a false concept of God and preach a plan of salvation with it. It's impossible. You can't preach a saving grace by a God that doesn't have any saving grace. You can't preach remission of sins by a God that can't forgive sins. You can't preach, amen, eternal salvation by a God that has no power to save you eternally. I'll tell you, their God has no heaven. Their God has no throne. Their God has no river of life. Their God has no Holy Ghost. Are you understanding me tonight? It's a different God we preach. We don't believe in the same God. Turn over Deuteronomy chapter 13 with me, please. I'm dogmatic, in case you haven't figured out yet. One guy said, you're so, so narrow-minded I could put out both your eyes with one finger. Amen. I am narrow-minded. Because you know what this Bible teaches? This Bible teaches we're supposed to believe in the true God and not to mess with any other gods. Is that what the Bible teaches? He said, They'll have, you'll have no other gods. He didn't say you shouldn't have. He said, you ain't going to have any. Absolutely. Don't, don't tell me. If you're going to worship me, you're not going to have any other gods. Amen. That's not a request God gave us. That's an order from heaven. You believe that? God said, if you're going to believe in me, I'm the only God you're going to ever talk about. I'm the only person you're ever going to worship. Amen. There aren't any other persons you're going to worship. And any time you start worshiping two or three people, you're not worshiping the Lord of glory. That's a fact of the matter. Come on, man. Deuteronomy chapter 13. 
if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let's go after other gods, which thou hast not known, or let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Some of you didn't even know that was in the Bible. Amen. God said, anybody comes along talking any other God except the God we're preaching. That's why John came down and said, if they'll preach any other Christ to you. Paul said in the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he said, I've espoused you to one husband. Amen. That I might present you to him as, as a chaste bride. But he said, I fear lest any man comes along and preaches to you another Christ, which we have not, another Jesus that we've not preached, or another spirit that we haven't received, or another gospel. You, you might well bear with him. What's he saying? He, Paul was seeing, brother, prophetically speaking, he was seeing that there were going to come men. That's why he told the Colossians, he said, Beware lest any man spoil you. Amen. Through philosophy and vain deceit. After traditions of men and the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ, for in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. They knew, brother, listen to me. Those old, those New Testament apostles knew by a revelation from heaven that there was going to come a false concept of God into the ranks of the church. They knew that it wasn't going to be many years after they were dead and gone that there would be men sneak into the congregation that would begin to say that the Word of the Lord was a separate person from God the Father. They was trying to preach that the Word was a different person than the person that sat on the throne and they knew that wasn't the truth but he said beware lest they come along with their philosophical ideas of God and their vain traditional thinking about their God brother everybody in this world's got an idea about who God is you know that your old ignorant neighbor has got an idea about who God is it may be totally wrong it may be completely heretical, but they got everybody's got an idea about God. Everybody worships God in their own way. They may they may tell you they're not very religious, but they got an idea about who God is. Do you know that's exactly what happened to the early church? Did you know, listen to me, that in the early church, those men preached that Jesus was the Lord of glory? Amen. They understood. There was no other name given among men under heaven whereby they must be saved except the name of Jesus. They understood that without the name of Jesus there was no remission of sins. Amen. Somebody said when Peter said what he did in Acts 2.38 about repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus, they said, well, I'd rather obey Jesus in Matthew 28.19 than Acts 2.38 where Peter was talking. As if to say Peter was wrong. I want to tell you why Peter told him to be baptized. In the name of Jesus, you know exactly why Peter said that? It's because in Luke, the 24th chapter, Jesus said, Amen, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name in all nations. I'll tell you, Peter had that fresh on his mind when that crowd come to him and said, How do you get this Holy Ghost? All Peter knew about how he got the Holy Ghost is that he repented and got baptized in the name of Jesus. And he remembered the words of Jesus that was ringing in his ears, saying, Preach repentance and remission missing of uh, sins in my name and all the world. That's why I stood up in that crowd that day and said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He was quoting Jesus Christ in Acts 2.38, friend. Eusebius was a 4th century church historian. He lived during the changeover from oneness preaching to Trinitarian preaching. Now listen, that early church, one of the men that Paul greeted in one of his epistles, a fellow named Clement, you recognize that name? He said, Greek Clement. Clement turned out to be one of the pastors in Rome. Amen. Old Peter, the Bible doesn't tell us that he ever went to Rome, but secular history records that he not only went to Rome, but that he actually was killed in Rome. They hung him upside down on a cross. He refused to die upright because that's the way Jesus had died, so it made him crucify him upside down. 
But Peter, you know good and well Peter was preaching Jesus' name baptism in Rome. Is that right? You know he's preaching that Jesus Christ was the Lord from glory. You know he was preaching, amen, that it, God was manifest in the flesh. You know he was believing that Jesus Christ was the image of the invisible God. You know he was preaching oneness. And you know he's preaching holiness, amen. But you know, after Peter died, there was other preachers that came to the pulpit. And, and secular history tells us those men were preaching a similar message, every one of them. There was 15 preachers in a row in the city of Rome, Italy itself, that continued to preach baptism in Jesus' name, the oneness of the Godhead, and holiness without which no man will see God. Clement was the third pastor preceding Peter, and he wrote two books called Clement, the first epistle of Clement, and the second epistle of Clement. And in those epistles, he himself made the statement that Jesus Christ was the Father before he came in the flesh. Ignatius was a pastor in Clement's day over in Antioch. Paul and Barnabas had started the church in Antioch. Ignatius wrote three epistles. And he preached the same message Paul and Barnabas preached. And isn't that strange? That he believed the same thing Paul and Barnabas preached. And he's baptizing folks in Jesus' name. And he's preaching holiness standards. And he's preaching the oneness of the Godhead. Oh, meanwhile, over in Smyrna, there was another preacher named Polycarp. He was, he come in after John. John had started the church in Smyrna. And he wrote epistles to him. Polycarp was preaching the same thing John had preached. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. Polycarp was preaching Jesus' name, baptism, oneness of the Godhead, and without holiness no man will see God. I'll tell you, brother, we've got roots tonight that goes way back. What we're preaching in this church tonight is not that something that came along in 1945. It's the same message that's been preached in this Bible since Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God's one Lord. Hallelujah. But there's a warning. There's a warning. Jesus said in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. In the original Greek, there's no punctuation in that statement. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, there's going to be a lot of folks saying I'm Christ, but they're going to deceive you. Folks talking about Jesus, much the same way we talk about Jesus. Talking about how much they love the Lord. Talking about the healing and the miracles and the signs and the wonders. Amen. And all the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. But Jesus said they're going to be preaching that I'm Christ, and they're going to deceive the fool out of you. How is that happening? Amen. Jesus said there's a crowd that's going to be casting out devils and healing the sick and raising the dead. And he's going to tell them he never knew them. He didn't ever know them. He didn't lie when he said that. What's going on? The prophecy is God saying just like he did right here in the 13th chapter of Deuteronomy. He said, I'm going to prove you. He said, there's going to come prophets in your midst. There's going to come dreamers of dreams into your midst. And he said, they're going to start performing signs and wonders. And they're going to say to you, let's go after other gods. And you're going to look at those signs and those wonders and you're going to say, my Lord, what's going on? This old boy must really have a true and a living God. And he said, you're going to be tempted to follow him and his signs and his wonders and miracles and looking at his other God. But God said, don't you do it. I'm allowing him in your midst to prove you, to find out whether you really do love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's why Jude said there were going to be ungodly men, unholy men, creeping in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. These are men that are wicked deceivers. He said, amen, they would turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, amen, and deny our only Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first things first, he said ungodly men, ungodly men, amen, they've crept in unawares. I'm talking about what we're seeing in the 20th century, friend, is the same thing that happened in the early church. Those men of God, listen to me, were prophesying that even though we've got true religion, God is going to allow false religion to thrive. Amen. God's going to allow false religion to thrive. Jeremiah said one day, 
He said, when I see all these wicked men, he said, where, or in the 12th chapter of Jeremiah, he said, where did all these wicked folks come from? And then he said, the Lord, he has planted them in the earth. Yeah. Only reason I'm coming on so strong with this is because too many of us have a notion that if a thing is not of God, God's just going to slap that thing and knock it out of the picture. That's ne never been taught in the Bible at all. Amen. He said, because sin is against an evil work, it's not executed speedily. Therefore, the hearts of the Son of Men is fully set in them to do evil continually. God has ordained. He said, Paul said to the Corinthians, there must be heresies among you that you might know those that are of the truth. God has sent heresies into this thing to test and to prove men to see what they believe. Which came first, the truth or the heresy? I'll tell you, the truth came first. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was the truth. You can believe that the first thing Israel knew was the truth, and afterward came the heresy. And the first thing the early church knew was the truth, and afterward the heresy. And the same thing is true about the modern church. The first thing that's been given to us is the truth, but God allowed that delusion to come in to test those that love the pleasures of sin. God said, if you don't really love me the way you know I am, if you don't care enough about the oneness of the Godhead, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and preach. Is that right? There's people in this crowd tonight. You don't really care uh, how to define the oneness of the Godhead. It ain't no big deal to you. you. You're oneness, you know, in a oneness church. But it's a funny thing, you know, how, how information oriented we can be. We, we'll subscribe to Reader's Digest and Newsweek and Time and Southern Living and People and everything else in the world. We like information of all sorts. We'll go and take night school at college, get a better education. We'll read all kinds of books trying to cram for more information. And we know a little bit about everything in this world. We still don't even know who God is. I will tell you something. I don't think for a minute I'd ever go to heaven if I didn't know who God was. I believe a man's got to know the God he's serving. Amen. I said, I believe a man's got to know the God that he serves. If you got a false notion about God, I don't see how, what, what purpose would you have in going to heaven? If you're going up there looking for three folks sitting on three thrones, heaven would be the biggest shock you ever had in your life, friend. And you, you can believe this or not. You won't be in that crowd if you don't know who God is. I believe there's one thing, one of the things that Moses told that crowd back yonder in Israel. He says, you're going to train your children about God. You're going to tell them that there is one Lord, that the Lord your God is one Lord. I want all of Israel to know. I want all of Israel to hear. The Lord your God is one Lord. That's all. When Elijah came along in Ahab's day, he called him prophets on the carpet. Now they weren't all Baal worshippers. They were mixed up. They were still worshiping Jehovah God and Baal. In other words, when a certain time come along, they's in there offering sacrifices just like they always had. But then on their off nights, they's down there at the temple of Baal. You understand what I'm saying? They had a little mixture. They found better religion, you see. Amen. They had all this idle time with this Jehovah religion, and so they kind of added this Baal worship to go along. And what Jehovah wouldn't do for them, Baal would do, they thought. But, but old Elijah come along, and he said, I'm going to ask you one thing right now. Which one of these gods do you believe in? How long are you going to halt between two opinions? Are you a Jehovah person, or are you a Baal person? You've got to make up your mind. You can't believe one way or the other. You've got to have one side. You've got to get on one side. You can't have both gods. I'm going to ask you tonight. What are you tonight? Are you a one God oneness believer? Are you a Trinitarian? How long are you going to halt between two opinions? Are you going to listen to the Trinitarian preachers? Are you going to listen to the Trinitarian quartets and singers? Are you going to read the Trinitarian books? Are you going to listen to Trinitarian tapes? How long are you going to stay mixed up between who God is? I'll tell you, it's time you make up your mind what you're going to believe about God. I used to have friends in school when I was assembly of God that was oneness. And even though we never could get together on our doctrine, we always 
assume, well, we're both worshiping the same God. And I got a feeling there's folks in this building that probably made very similar statements in your day. Well, we don't agree about the doctrine, but we're worshiping the same God. That's hogwash. I said, that's hogwash. We're the only one God folks around, brother. I said, we're the only one person in the Godhead folks around. You understand what I'm saying to you? It does make a difference. It does make a difference. If your God's got one head or three heads, are you going to halt between the two opinions? Can you listen to Brother Harold and he is preaching that will just blow anybody's mind away and then go out yonder and turn your old crazy radio on and listen to R.W. Shambach and Jimmy Swagger and Kenneth Hagin and Copeland and try to mix the two together? I'll tell you where you're headed. God said, I've sent him along to prove you and to see if you love God. I'll tell you the next time you listen you better watch out God's going to lay a stumbling block in your pathway and you're going to fall flat on your face it makes a difference I said it makes a difference I said it makes a difference God said I'll give you a prophet that'll say I got another God for you and he said I'm going to let that prophet do miracles The Lord warned Moses when he went down there to Pharaoh. He said, I'm going to let you turn this stick here into a snake. But he said, I'll warn you before you ever try it. It ain't going to work. And he said, the reason it ain't going to work is because I'm going to let his, his prophets, they're going to turn their sticks into snakes too. That's why Paul told Timothy, he said, as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, they're going to withstand you. Did you know that God has already plotted the temptation of the oneness movement by the Trinitarian movement? Did you know God said, as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, they're going to withstand you? Did you know that the conflict that's on between Trinitarianism and oneness is a test sent from heaven to challenge us and see if we really do believe what we say we believe? I want to tell you further. You've been rubbing shoulders with that Trinitarian crowd. You've been talking with your old charismatic friends. You've been rubbing shoulders with a crowd that don't believe doodly squat, and you know it. They don't have a conviction about holiness. They don't believe in a standard of living. They they don't believe that Jesus is the Father. They, will, they refuse to be baptized in the name of the Lord. They believe you can be saved without the Holy Ghost. It's time you recognize the fact you and Him don't even have the same God. You don't even deserve to be in a conversation about the same God because it is not the same God. It makes no difference. They do call it Jesus. It's another Jesus Paul was warning about. It's another Jesus Paul was warning about. They came into that early church. The first one stood up in 130 A.D. in the city of Athens, Greece. And he began to say, I believe the Word is another person. Well, wasn't a lot of folks bought his fabrication and not much came out of that crowd there in Athens. But about ten years later, a fellow named Justin Martyr stood up in the city of Rome. And he said, he said, these folks over here that's trying to tell you that Jesus is the Father, he said, they're heretics. He said, I'm here to tell you that God the Father has never suffered, that He's never left heaven, that the Son is the Word that has come down to us to suffer and that He is going to give His glory to God the Father. And once He got that all planted in there in the folks' mind, then He began to say that this thing, this tongue-talking business these Pentecostal folks was doing, He said, you see now, He said, that Spirit over there, they're talking in tongues. He said, that is the Spirit that Jesus, the second person, has sent down to us. He is the third person of the Godhead. Justin Martyr began to preach that. I want to tell you something. That was never preached in the early church until 140 A.D. when Justin Martyr began to preach that. But I'll tell you, it didn't take long. Amen. There was a few of them began to get around. And at first, they didn't really get any headway into the church. They were just kind of talking it up in houses and among their friends. But by the year 217, if you could have traced the history of the entire early church, if you could have seen what happened in Jerusalem and in Smyrna, and in Ephesus, and in Corinth, 
and some of the great churches of that day, you would have seen a very similar pattern as to what happened in Rome. Because in 217, here we are, 15 pastors after Peter's lived and died, and the church is still preaching baptism in the name of Jesus, the oneness of the Godhead, holiness without which no man will see God. And there's a preacher there in Rome. There's 12 churches in town. The year is 217 A.D. Pastor by the name of Callistus is the presbyter over all 12 churches. He's one of the strongest oneness preachers that ever walked the face of the planet Earth. He preached that the mighty God was Jesus in the flesh. And he's preaching on holiness in Jesus' name, baptism. And for five years he was a presbyter of those twelve oneness Jesus' name apostolic holiness churches in the city of Rome. But in that crowd came a man was listening to old Justin Martyr's teaching. He began to preach the separation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, trying to preach a Trinitarian concept of God. Old Brother Callistus over there, one of the best oneness Jesus' name preachers you ever met. And he looks down yonder on the other side of town. He thinks to himself, well, you know, it'll all, it'll all come out in the wash. He, he didn't feel anything, any compulsion evidently to rebuke that fellow for what he was preaching. After all, we got 12 oneness preachers in town. Only one of them now preaching the wrong thing. Sooner or later, we'll get rid of him. He'll, all, he'll end up one of these days... Just, Somebody run him out of town. But you know what this Bible said? It goes away back. God said when that fellow comes in among you and starts preaching another God in your midst, he'll have signs and wonders and miracles. Do you know that 12th church there in Rome? They were still talking in tongues. They were still casting out devils. They were still reporting miracles of healings. They were still having the dead raised. They had the same signs and wonders as the other 11 Pentecostal churches in the city of Rome. And Callistus didn't feel any obligation to run that Trinitarian preacher out of that church. But it was just a matter of time. Within five years from 217 A.D., old preacher over yonder, old Trinitarian, he began to circulate his doctrine among those other pastors. And right there in the city of Rome, where they had great Pentecostal holiness, oneness, Jesus' name churches, he began to, he began to preach dissension among them, began to preach another concept of God in the history... Historians record that in the five years of that Trinitarian being in that one little church over there, he began to supplant the work of God. He began to water down the message of holiness. They said the crowds in that little church began to build phenomenally as folks began to come in because now they could have the blessings of God without a holiness standard. And this Trinitarian concept was off and running. The next thing you know, he'd circulated around some of the other preachers and they'd begin to demoralize their own ministries. Several of them left their wives, divorced them, and married other women. Their churches began to compromise on the standard. And within five years, every church in Rome had turned Trinitarian. They had taken that oneness presbyter and drowned him in a well and put a Trinitarian preacher in as a presbyter of Rome. Just a few years later, 317, Constantine of Rome, Caesar, was converted to so-called Christianity. The only problem was he wasn't converted to what the apostles had preached. He was converted to this new Trinitarian concept. And by 325, he called together some of the biggest leaders of his day. They pronounced a curse on everyone that was baptized in the name of Jesus and literally excommunicated every Jesus name believer and killed, killed them. The, the law said if they weren't baptized in the titles Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they were to be excommunicated and the Jesus name people were to be killed. I'll tell you that's what Trinitarianism will do to the truth. Do you understand what I'm saying to you tonight? I'm here to preach to you. We've got a good doctrine. We've got the doctrine that's the plan of salvation. We've got the truth about who God is tonight. We know that Jesus is the Lord of glory, but we've got to stay separate. This Bible said you've got to be separate. You've got to touch not that other thing. He said that that prophet or that dreamer comes in there. He said, I'm going to prove you. I'm going to find out if you really do believe this thing. And he said, furthermore, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him. And he said, that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death.
God said, if that fella is out to pervert you, kill him! The ceremonial law has been dispersed with. There are no more blood sacrifices. There's no more labor. There's no more tabernacle per se. The ceremony and the ritual of the law has been dispensed with. But I'll tell you, the morality of the law has never been eliminated. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I come to fulfill it. Amen. He said, the law is preached to you that you ought not commit adultery. I'm telling you, if you look on a woman to lust after, you've committed adultery in your heart. He said, the law said, if you, if you kill a man, you're a murderer and you'll die for it. I'm here to tell you, if you hate a man with your heart, you're the same as a murderer. What is he going to say about this false doctrine issue? Is he going to say it was all right? Amen. It was all right for them to kill him in those days. But today it's all right if you have fellowship with them. You can listen to them preach. You can listen to them sing. You can call them your brothers and your sisters. You can pray with them. You can have a good time of fellowship with them. No, sir, brother. He said, him that's a heretic after the first and second admonitions reject him. He said, if anybody preaches another doctrine, whether it's a man or an angel, let him be a curse. He said, if anybody comes in here that keeps not the traditions that we preach, he said, have no company with him, no, not even to eat with him. You say, how are you ever going to get anybody saved if you don't have any company with them? I'll tell you how. This Bible says, if you abide in the vine, come on now. He said, if my words abide in you, if you abide in me, you can ask what you will, and it shall be done. If I stay rooted and planted in the truth, if I walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with the other. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. Where does the fruit come in? Amen. I'll tell you what David said in Psalm 1. Amen. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or sits in the seat of the scornful, or stands in the way with the sinners, but in his law doth he meditate both day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters of of life who who leaf fadeth not and who bears his fruit in due season. I want to tell you something. There's a virtue in being separate. We may be a puny thing in number compared to the Trinitarian crowd out there. We may seem like we're just a losing minority when it comes to the vast amount of folks out there that believes in that other God. But I want to tell you the truth of the matter. If we'll keep ourselves pure from it, if we'll keep ourselves, this Bible said true religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. God ain't looking for numbers. He's looking for men and women that knows who He is and will worship Him. The Father seeketh such as will worship Him in spirit and in truth. That early church was always in trouble. You know, one of the reasons why it's hard for us to be dogmatic in the presence of other doctrinal positions is that the first thing we say about our doctrine, they want us to tell them if we think they're saved. Well, say, you, you, you say, uh, I got to be baptized in the name of Jesus, right? Yeah. You tell me I got to have the Holy Ghost, yeah. Well, in other words, you tell me because I'm not baptized in the name of Jesus, I'm not saved, right? How many, time, how many times have you been cornered with that number? Come on. Why you reckon early church was always in trouble? Why you reckon they wanted to gnash on them with their teeth? Why you reckon they're always throwing stones at them? Why you reckon they're always trying to burn them at the post and drown them in the drink? Why you reckon they're always trying to persecute them, torment them, run them out? I'll tell you why, because the truth hurts. 
I said the truth hurts a man that hates God, a man that's selfish and carnal. The truth hurts. Amen. But the truth, the Bible said, is the only thing that can set you free. You can tell a man that he's, that he's a brother of yours. You can lead him to believe that you're living and worshiping the same God and you've done nothing for his soul. You've soothed his condemned conscience. You've led him to believe he's saved without knowing the truth. But I'll tell you, if you take your stand on the truth, that's the only hope a man's got is to know the truth of the matter. I'm not related to that crowd. I am not related. I am not related. Ben-Hadad and that army of Syrians tried to get old Ahab in the corner. Except God blessed them and gave them a victory. Destroyed, I don't know, better than 100,000 folks. And uh, Ahab had been Hadad, the king. Caught him alive, you know, threw him over in a prison. And that crowd of leftover Syrians was trying to figure out some way to get Ben Hadad out of prison, trying to get him loose from Ahab, you know. And he's listening, evidently through a window or something one day, trying to figure out something. Listen to old Ahab talking. And they heard him say something while he's in there in his chamber about his brother, Ben Hadad. You know, best I can figure, Ahab was a Jew, and Ben Hadad was a Syrian. I don't believe there's any relationship between Jews and Syrians directly. And for Ahab to call that Ben Hadad Syrian a brother, seemed to be a mighty dumb thing to do. Of course, he had his reasoning, you know. Well, I'm a king and he's a king. Even though he's a Syrian and I'm a Jew, the fact that he's a king and I'm a king, I guess that makes us brothers. But those princes that was trying to get Ben-Hadad loose, they said, aha, that's his weak point. He, he kind of thinks that he's got something in common with Ben-Hadad. And they got in there and they started talking to Ahab. They said, listen, now you, you done had a great military victory. Uh, we waved the white flag. We have give up. And you, you got it. You know, it's all yours. You're the winner. And said, you got no use now for Ben-Hadad. He's a, he may be a king, but he's got no army left. You, got, you squashed him good. So why don't you just let him go? Just let him Well, I guess so. Ben's army is defeated. He must have left he could do to harm me, I guess. But take him. He's yours. He had no sooner got rid of Ben Hadad, and the Bible said no prophet come along. Said Ahab, what in the world are you doing anyway? He said, You know, God says. Because you had in your hand a man that was appointed to destruction. And you said, my brother. Not only that, but you let him go. He said, Ahab, you're going you're gonna to suffer for it. God's going to smite you dead on account of that. You may not see this exactly the way I'm fixing to say it. But every issue in this Bible is an issue of holiness. Every issue, every doctrine is an issue of holiness. Because it's saying this, God is saying, you're going to believe this doctrine the way it is, in truth, in purity, in sanctity, in holiness, or are you going to just believe this as much as it makes you comfortable and you're going to mix whatever else you believe with it? God's saying every doctrine is vitally important. There is nothing that you can claim a relationship to if it's not planted in the Word of God as being the truth. Amen. What we have here is a religion that is very holy. Yeah. What you and I are a part of here tonight is a very unique, 
a very special religion. He says, you are a chosen generation. You are a peculiar people. You are a royal priesthood that you might show forth the praises of Him that has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. It's time that the oneness, Jesus' name, apostolic, holiness, tongue-talking crowd realize we're the only things like it in the earth. And if we're going to talk to anybody, they need to realize our God's a different God. Our Jesus is a different Jesus. Our Lord's a different Lord. Our spirit is a different spirit. Sure, they read the same Bible. But their God saves them without the name of Jesus in the water for the remission of sins. Their God will let them go to heaven without being baptized in His name. Their God does not require you to have the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues to go to heaven. Come on now. Their God says all you got to do is and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. Oh, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sins. And sign a membership card, shake the preacher's hands, and you're gone. Their God is not my God. Come on now. Their God is not my God. Their God saves them or professes to save them. The fact is, David said, <laughs> he said, their God has eyes, but he can't see. Their God has ears, but he can't hear. Their God has a mouth, but he can't talk. Our God's in the heavens. He made the heavens and the earth. He's got eyes he can see, ears he can hear, mouth he can talk, feet he can walk, hands he can feel. He's the Lord of glory. He's the great I am. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the first and the last. He's everything. My God, we're worshiping the only true God. If we believe what I'm preaching here tonight, we'd be dangerous. But the less we believe it, we just kind of blend in with the crowd. God help. If only the only difference they can tell is the way we wear our hair. That's the least difference between us, if the facts were known. I said that's the least difference between us, is the way we wear our bodies outside. Come on now. The biggest difference between us is we don't have the same God. There's some of you in this building don't believe what I'm saying tonight, but I'm going to tell you it's the truth anyhow. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. If you can't explain the oneness of God, if you can't explain how that Jesus and the Father won, brother, you missed the boat. It's time for you to get your nose in the Bible and figure out who in the world is your God anyway. Who is your God? Can't you explain to me who your God is? If you can't tell me who your God is, how in the world can you even prove you've got a God? But I'll tell you what, if you ever want to do figure out, and you ever want to do get in a position where you can tell somebody who your God is, you're going to be so dangerous, you're going to be dynamite. Amen. You know what this Bible said? They that know thy name shall do exploits. When you really begin to see who God is, you're going to be dangerous. I know I'm uncouth. I know I have a saggy approach. But I believe what I believe, brother. When I came in here on a Wednesday night before last New Year's Eve, and I stood over there on that third row, and you were singing, The mighty God is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. The everlasting Father. And that course said it's all in Him. It's all in Him. I said to Dixie, I got a hook in my jaw. They're talking about a God I ain't never heard of. 
I ain't never figured this out about God. This ain't the God I've been listening about all my life. When I left the charismatic movement, till I was 25 years old, I was in the Assemblies of God. And three years I spent in the charismatic movement. And when I got out of that and got turned an atheist, began to live wild and wicked like every, every other sinner does, I told my wife, I said, for everything that's in me, if ever, all the religion I've had all my life, if there was anything at all to it, it would have worked out better than this. I'm telling you, the God I believed in all my life didn't exist. I decided that five years ago. But I, but I used it to prove there was no God, you see. I'd believed in a Trinitarian concept of God all my life. I didn't realize it was an issue about the concept I had. I thought the issue was that religion itself was a dud. I just thought that the whole issue, the Bible and religion and churches and preachers and Bibles and everything else, I had decided that, that it was all just a hoax. The whole thing was just a bunch of garbage. But I come to find out, in spite of the fact, that I never could find satisfaction in all the roads I went down. I found there is a living God. But it's not the same God. It's not the same. I had to have a whole new understanding. Solomon said, with all you're getting, you better get understanding. Is that right? With all you're getting, you better get understanding. It's good. It's good if you can come in here and get a healing for your cancer or your, your health or whatever's wrong with you. It's great and good if you can come into Pentecostal church and get healed. It's good if you've been in financial trouble, if you can come into a Pentecostal church and work out your financial problem. It's good if your family's been broken up, if you can get back in here and get your marriage together. It's good, brother, if you get your kids in here and train them up right. But I want to tell you there's something bigger and more important than your healing and your finances and your marriage. You better get in here and find out who God is. You better worship of the one true living God. You better find out who His name is with all you're getting. Get understanding. Find out who the Lord of glory is. Hallelujah. And when you do, I used to watch folks come and go from church. You know, they'd come in and get all worked up and directly they'd just backslide and then they'd be back, put their cigarettes out on the porch of the church and come on in and dive in like they'd never been out of it, you know. Come and go with very little consequence. But I found that there's a religion and there's a God that you don't treat like that. The God I'm serving tonight, I'm scared of it. When I got out of church before, I hated everything I knew about religion. I blasphemed by design. I concocted ways to blaspheme God. I cursed and reviled. I did every kind of wickedness I could think in my mind to do. But Paul said, what I did, I did ignorantly and unbelief. But I'm going to tell you something. What I know about God tonight, I can't get away from. I've learned something about God. It's so big and so powerful. It does make a difference. You see, you can worship a false god and you can blaspheme him and no consequence will ever come to it. But there's a living God, brother. Jesus said, now you can mess with the Son of Man. Amen. Not get yourself in serious trouble. But when you start messing with the Holy Spirit, with the one Spirit of God, when you start messing with that which is eternal, with that which is holy, with that which is pure, with that which is sacred, with that which is unadulterated and undefiled and untouchable, you are messing with the wrong one, brother. You can't mess with the Spirit of God and come out winning. You'll lose every time. It's time for the church to realize what we have is a pearl of great price. What we have tonight, he said, Jesus speaking, blessed are your eyes. Oh my God, see, listen to me. Blessed are your eyes because you see what you see. Blessed are your ears because you hear what you hear. But for many righteous men and great prophets desired to know what you know. They searched diligently for it and they couldn't find it. But it's real, it's real. Hallelujah. Oh, God. I could preach all night long, but I know my time's up. I don't come with a notebook of sermon, but I've had an experience in my life. 
I had a Nebuchadnezzar experience. And it scared the fool out of me. I realized that this God that we talk about, He's to be respected. He's to be loved. And He said, I'll have no other gods. You will have no other gods. You will have no other gods. If you mess with that other religion, you listen to that other religious preaching, you don't think there's any consequence to that. You think somehow you can just blend that in with this Jesus name stuff. I'm telling you, you better, you better quit halting between two opinions. You better make up, what are you going to believe? What do you want? What do you want? Listen to me. What do you want? Which God do you want? If we're going to be oneness, let's be oneness. If we're going to be holiness, let's be holiness. And while I'm on it, I'm going to finish up with this. The false prophet and the dreamers aren't just peddling Trinitarianism either. There's other, there's other spirits that's trying to work in this congregation. There are seducers trying to get a hold of young people in this church. They're trying to get you to follow after other gods. The Bible said if the gospel's hid, it's hid to those that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded. Did you know that it is ordained of God that at this present time, that the spirit of darkness, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, has been given power by God to prevail on all those that receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved? Did you know that this Bible said because you don't have a, a vehement desire in your heart to understand these doctrines, because you don't receive a love for the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness? Is there anybody in this building at this moment is having pleasure in unrighteous things? Is there one person, is there a young person in this building tonight that's having pleasure in unrighteousness? God is saying, listen to me. God is saying if you have the audacity... Knowing what you know about God. Having the revelation of the Godhead the way you have it. Having received the Holy Ghost. Having been baptized in the name of Jesus. He said if you have the audacity to take pleasure in unrighteous things, He will send to you. Who? God will send to you a strong delusion. I'm not talking about another church across the county. Not everybody in this church is going to heaven. And if you're one of the young people that thinks you're so big and so high and mighty that you can do unrighteous things and you're living... You think you can get by with things at school that your parents don't know you're up to. You can hang around a crowd that you know is not living right. I'm warning you tonight. God said if you have pleasure in unrighteousness, I'm going to deceive you. I'm going to delude you. He said I'll give you a strong delusion. There's people sitting in this building. There's nowhere on this earth you could go to get a clearer message than what's being preached in this church. There's no church you can go to in this country to better understand the way to live. And you tread on it. You stomp on it. You mock it. You go on and in spite of the holiness and the righteous standard that's being preached in this congregation, you have pleasure in wicked deeds. Your mind constantly is roaming on ungodly things. You remember that on a Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Ken Raggio said, you're fixing to stumble and fall and you won't be able to get up 
you're going to stumble and you're going to fall and you will not be able to get up. Because this Bible says, if you have pleasure in unrighteousness, He said, I'm going to prove you. you. You've got as good a revelation as anybody. Amen. But He said, I'm going to prove you. I'll let somebody come along that will sell you a bill of goods. He said, I'm going to prove you. If you don't love this thing, if you don't have the discernment, if you don't have the fortitude and the character of person to hold fast to what you have, that no man can get your crowd. God, God is going to let you be deceived. It's the most horrible thing I can think of. It'll strike fear in your heart if you ever once begin to get a hold of it. God said, do you want it? If you do, hold on to it tight. Because if you don't hold tight, I'm going to let somebody take it away from you. You say, is it really that easy to lose? It's easier than that. If 12 churches can be destroyed by one man, erroneous teaching, the entire early church was driven into extinction because one man of God would not withstand a false prophet in the midst. Did you know the whole history of the early church came to a halt because one man that knew the truth would not drive from his fellowship a man that was planting the wrong kind of seed. I'm telling you this, this evening that if you want to live right for God, if you want to be saved, you better drive all that evil stuff out of your life. You better drive sin as far from you as it'll go. You better get those wicked friends out of your life. You better get those dirty jokes out of your mind. You better leave them filthy magazines alone. You better separate yourself from that crowd you're running with. You better leave that lying, seducing spirit alone. You better get away from those folks that has that other God, that has that other religion, that has that other denomination, that has that other doctrine. I'll tell you, God says, if you don't put it out of your midst, you're going to be a snare. He said, line on line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little, I'll speak to you. But why did He say that you might go and that you might fall backward and that you might be broken and that you might be snared and they might be taken? Every time there comes a full revelation of the truth, every time doctrine comes to an apex, a pinnacle, to this highest point, God said, I bring you to a full revelation so that you might be tested. And when you're tested, it's going to prove whether or not you believe it for all it's worth. I'll tell you, every time a man gets to a full revelation of God, Jesus said, I counsel you to buy of me gold that's tried in the fire. There's not going to be anything. This Bible said, the day shall declare it, for it shall be tried by fire. Every man is going to be tested. Your faith is going to be tested. Your doctrine is going to be tested. Your salvation experience is going to be tested. And you better be ready to give a strong stand in the day of your test. Let's stand. Hallelujah. I want us to turn to page 369. Hallelujah. Where the mighty God is Jesus, the Prince of Peace is He, the everlasting Father, the King eternally, the Four. By whom all things are made, fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is displayed. Oh, it's all in Him. Sing it. It's all in Him. The fullness of the Godhead. It's all in Him. Oh, it's all. It's all in Him. The mighty God is Jesus. It's all in Him, Emmanuel, God with us, Jehovah, Lord of hosts, the omnipresent Spirit that fills the universe. Head and high priest, the Lamb for sinners slain, the author of redemption, all glory to His name. Well, it's all in Him. It's all in Him, the fullness of the Godhead, all in